Eskerrik asko gorrotxategi irakaslea. Thank you very much, Professor Gorrocha Tegui. We're especially excited to introduce our next guest since it is not the first time we have had the honor of listening to her passion for knowledge. I'm talking about none other than Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the woman who discovered the pulsar in this image of the pulsar is the image that represents the festival this year. We wanted this image to be everywhere in uh, Donostia, in San Sebastian. In 1967, Bell discovered a series of extremely regular radio wave signals that were then dubbed LGMS, uh, Little Green Men, at the time in reference to the remote possibility that they uh, were attempts at communication by some kind of extraterrestrial life form. It was finally discovered that they came from neutron stars that were formerly, and then uh, they were formerly christened pulsars. This scientific discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1974. It was not Bell herself who received the, the award, though. However, in uh, 2018, she did receive the elaborate through award for her scientific uh, contributions. And uh, all uh, the money she got from there were, um, was given to students of physics. Today, she will be interviewed by Pedro Miguel Echenique, president of the Donostia International Physics Center. Let us greet her with another warm round of applause, please. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon, Jocelyn. Let me first of all very briefly explain why uh, we have a, this new format. Uh, Normally, Jocelyn participates in uh, our event, and her talks are very clear, they're brilliant, and suddenly catches the interest of the audience. Um, this time, though, we prefer to go for something different, to pay tribute to Jocelyn Bell. Why? Because we were very sure that her talk uh, and her lecture would have been wonderful, but she has turned 80, and. Uh, it has been said, and I agree, that maybe uh, there are very few people alive, if any, that have contributed to science uh, as much uh, as her. I mean, science as such, with pulsars, etc., but also science as, as, as a culture, and also institutions. And uh, she's been so generous and has helped uh, so many young scientists belonging to minorities. And this is why we wanted to pay a tribute uh, to Jocelyn Bell. Uh, we want uh, people in San Sebastian to know this uh, exceptional person, this ex exceptional human being. She's been in Sas San Sebastian a few times, and I've been told, Jocelyn, that uh, you've been seen in the uh, old town of San Sebastian buying a book about how to learn Basque in uh, 20 days. Is it right? Is it true? You were so interested uh, in the Basque uh, verses yesterday, uh, improvised verses. The, the Breakthrough Special Prize uh, was awarded to you. You received three million year, uh, dollars, three million dollars. Um, this is three times as much money as the Nobel Prize. Um, and you decided to allocate this money entirely to scholarships for, for women, refugees, and uh, underrepresented minorities. Um, you were in uh, Cambridge, and did you have to face difficulties that you shouldn't have had because you were a woman, and maybe you wanted to compensate for that and support other women so that they didn't have to uh, go through all these uh, troubles? I, I reckon that uh, a large factor in my work as a graduate student in Cambridge that led to the discovery was because I felt an outsider. I had come from the north and west of the country, not from southeast England, which is the proper part of England. Uh, and uh, I had a, an accent that was really very crude, I think they thought. 
And I quickly realized that uh, I was not an insider there. And I suspected also that they had quickly decided because I was not an insider, I was not intelligent. And so I decided the way I would manage to survive in Cambridge um, for as long as I could, I knew I would not survive very long. I would probably not get my degree, but uh, until they decided I must go, I would work my very hardest. So that when they said, shoo, I would feel I had done the best I could and I just was not good enough. Before you got to Cambridge, you had uh, some difficulties as well in your previous studies. You didn't pass an important exam when you were 18 years old, right? You failed it. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And that uh, maybe she could have expelled you from the system too early and uh, um, your parents didn't differentiate between pinks and blues and uh, this helped you to fly and uh, let your mind fly and that's that's uh, you were lucky weren't you i was lucky in my parents undoubtedly um, for example when i moved into the secondary schooling where you have lots of different subjects and different teachers um, the first week the wednesday of the first week a message went round the first year class. This afternoon, boys there, girls there. And I thought, this is sport. It wasn't. That where the boys went was the science lab. That where the girls went was the cookery room. Shocking discrimination. And my parents had told me I would get to do science when I got to the big school. And here I am to learn cookery while the boys learn science. I told my parents that evening, they were oof. They telephoned the local doctor who also had a daughter in the same class who had been told the same thing. And those parents also oof. And also a third set of parents. And the head teacher's telephone was quite hot that night. And the next time the science class met, there were three girls and all the boys. And that teacher had never taught girls before. We were dynamite. <laughs> so if I am the science teacher, he makes us three girls sit here and then all the boys elsewhere because we are going to be trouble. <laughs> but we weren't. <laughs> <coughs> Como... And um, how do you think, um, oh, well, I think that the situation's changed. The um, situation now is very different. Um, the role you, some, of, some women you have played as leaders and uh, working so hard for this not to happen again has been impressive. You developed a technique that consisted in the following. Whenever you went to a class or a seminar and you listened to the initial hypothesis of the teacher, in the end you always asked, well, and if that hypothesis were not true, how would things change? How would everything change? And um, like that, you created a wave of fear in all the seminars you attended. No, I didn't, because by this time it was Cambridge and no male in Cambridge is afraid. They are ultimately confident. <laughs> but it was an important question to ask, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, you know, pull the rug underneath. <laughs> Good. Well, we're talking about uh, imposters, uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, you mentioned the... Um, arrogant uh, Cambridge students, uh, and uh, I am one of them, you felt you were less valuable somehow. And so, um, and you said, okay, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to show them uh, what I'm capable of. Yes. Yeah, Cambridge was quite daunting. 
I don't know if in this country you've been aware of our last Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Well, he's from Oxford. He's from Oxford, <laughs> but he's of that generation. Yeah. Infinite self-confidence. Oh, I am right. I am always right. I understand. You know. And Cambridge was full of young men like that. There were very few women but there were lots of young men who had been at expensive schools and knew it all, and it was so easy, and their professors were just stupid. So, yeah. And I come from the north and west of the country. I have a different accent. I don't have that self-confidence. They have made a mistake admitting me they are going to discover their mistake and will throw me out. But until they throw me out, I will work my very hardest so that when they throw me out, I will know I've done my best. I will not have wasted the opportunity. No guilty conscience. E and do you think that was decisive to discover pulsars? Because talking with you uh, a few days back, uh, you told me that uh, in two and a half kilometers of paper, you know, the signals were hidden there somewhere in three millimeters. And uh, was it your determination uh, due to this imposter syndrome? Was that what really um, pushed you, what really made you give the best of yourself? Was that key for this discovery? I think it was. I think I was being so thorough, so careful, so that I would not have a guilty conscience when they threw me out, <laughs> that I noticed this tiny signal, which I can't explain. But I must explain it. I have to explain it. And I can't explain it. It must have been hard. You never thought, uh, I'm going to drop this. I'm going to stop. I'm going to quit. I always wanted to be a radio astronomer. Um, I had originally thought I would go to Jodrell Bank, which is part of the University of Manchester, and I worked there one summer. But I was told that um, the head of the observatory, Sir Bernard Lovell, would not allow a woman, because previously there had been a woman, and she and a young man had used the dormitory for a use for which it was not intended. He bragged. Sir Bernard got to hear about it and said, no more women. Interesting which sex pays the price for these mutual encounters. So I didn't think I would be accepted at Jodrell Bank. I would never get into Cambridge. So I go to Australia next January, February. Do you think that imposter syndrome, uh, it may not have been uh, with Cambridge, maybe it, this is about women, being a woman or not being a woman, uh, feeling that you're not worth. It's about being a female scientist. And there weren't many female scientists. I did not have many role models. Um, so I'd had no pattern to shape, help shape my career. I was very much on my own. But I wanted to do radio astronomy. <laughs> so you, you enjoy it so much that you fight for it. Yes. Yeah. It's curious how you it's funny, I used to think that imposter syndrome affects more women than men, but the DIPC uh, director, Ricardo Diez Muño, who is very careful about this type of thing, we at DIPC, we, we just uh, see students, people, right? We don't see men or women, and we see that there are many men that have the imposter syndrome, and I was surprised by that. Let's talk about a uh, Nobel Prize. I have to ask you about this. Um, this question, uh, I think you've uh, been asked this question many, many times, so my question is not going to be a surprise. Um, uh, 
it's to your credit that for the first time a Nobel Prize was awarded to an astrophysical discovery, even though you were not the winner. It was your patience, your rigor, and your tenacity that led to this discovery. So before we talk about this guilt, um, what do you think is the most interesting thing about pulsars? What are pulsars, by the way? Why are they interesting? What have you learned from pulsars? And what is yet to be learned about them? So when a big star reaches the end of its life, because they're burning, they're shining, they're using fuel, and one day the fuel will run out. And if it is a big star, it explodes, except for the core that gets crushed as everything else explodes. And that crushed core becomes one of these neutron stars or pulsars. And all stars are rotating. And if you crush a rotating body, shrink a rotating body, it spins faster. So pulsars are tiny, a radius of 10 kilometers, and they spin very, very fast. They weigh the same as the sun, but all in a 10 kilometer ball. Um. And um, what have you learned from pulsars? What have they taught you? Well, they've taught us quite a lot about compressed material, although there's still a lot more work to do on that. Um, but because the pulsar is spinning and spinning very accurately, they're quite good clocks. They go pulse, 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 mm -hmm. forever. And so throughout the galaxy, we have clocks, pulsars. And that enables us to study the galaxy using these clocks, studying gravity, local gravity, things like that, the way the galaxy rotates and so on. And with time, I think we'll find pulsars in other galaxies. We've not yet got the equipment for that, but it'll come. And so it's telling us quite a lot about galaxies, or at least our galaxy, and the history of our galaxy. In 1974, the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded to Sir Martin Riley and Tony Hewitt. In Cavendish. I was a student at the time, and I wasn't aware that uh, you were the one who had discovered pulsars. Um, Many people, prominent people, uh, protested. Verhoeven, for instance, who is not with us uh, any longer. But I had this feeling that uh, they wouldn't, were not protesting to defend you precisely, but there were people who coined a very intelligent term saying that the prize had become a Nobel because it wasn't given to you. What do you think about that? How did you feel then? It was a very special day for me. At that stage, um, I had a job in X-ray astronomy. And you cannot do X-ray astronomy from the Earth because the atmosphere cuts out all the X-rays, which is good for us. But it means to do X-ray astronomy, you have to get a satellite up above. And our satellite was launching that morning. And we came in 8 o'clock in the morning we had no video link, but we had an audio link, and we heard the countdown, 10, 9, 8, and then whoosh, and off it goes. And an hour or so later, they are switching the satellite on, and it's going well. Um, after several orbits, first of all, the programmers say, we must get that program working, the satellite's going to work. And then most of us drifted back to our desks. And a few hours later, at about one minute past midday, a colleague came rushing into my office. Have you heard the news? Have you heard the news? Uh oh. The satellite's gone. <laughs> it wasn't. It was the announcement of the Nobel Prize to Martin Ryle and Tony Hewish. And that particular colleague liked to stir. So he was, you know, keen to see my reaction. But actually, I was pleased because I realized immediately that until then, no Nobel Prize had been given for any topic in astronomy.
this was the first time there was astronomy recognized by the Nobel Physics Prize. And I knew that other astronomers would follow. So I was really pleased. And he was disappointed that I was pleased. <laughs> Now, you've said at some point that, uh, you know, you understood that Nobel Prizes shouldn't be awarded to students, except in very, very exceptional cases. Uh, that, that, that wasn't your case. Uh, that humility that you show, would you still react in that same way now? I mean, this is what you said, or were you just being cautious? at the time, because you didn't want to, you know, stir up trouble, you didn't want to put your job in danger. Would you react in the same way today? Certainly being as tactful as I could, because I did not have a secure job, and I could not afford to make the senior astronomers angry. Um, but I do note that about two or three years later, the Nobel Physics Prize was given for pulsar work, Yes. to Joe Taylor and his former grad student, Russell Hulse. They included the grad student. Joe Taylor is a good friend of mine, and he invited me to go to the Nobel Prize ceremony as his guest. And the Nobel Secretariat were <laughs> very anxious, but we behaved. It was good. And it was actually more fun to be there as a guest than a recipient, because when you are receiving the prize, you do this presentation, you do that speech, you meet the king, you do this, you do that, you do the next. And it's very hard work for about 10 days, so don't win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Every time we meet with the Nobel Prize and the young students, I tell them these are normal persons and if you work like that, you could be like that. I am changing language again. <laughs> it can be our idioma. Yeah. So I've just swapped languages there. I'm saying that every time I meet students, I say, you know, Nobel laureates, they're normal people. If you work really hard, uh, you can be like them and you can win a Nobel Prize too. And then you come along and you've, you know, mucked that all up now. In the communicado de prensa, in uh, in the press release, you weren't mentioned. The fact that you know the student, you weren't even mentioned. There are another couple of cases in the history of physics. One is Madame Gull and Lisa Miner. It's the other case. Uh, if you've seen the film Oppenheimer, we all know what I'm talking about. But in fact. Thanks to the fact that uh, you um, you don't have the Nobel Prize, you've become the sort of the absent star of the universe, at least here in the Basque Country. So, as well as teaching, there's another aspect to your personality, which is religion. You are a practicing uh, a Quaker, right? In San Sebastian, uh, Quakers aren't very well known. I am quite familiar uh, with Quakers because um, one of my teachers was a Quaker. Now, uh, are the Quakers, is it is different uh, as, uh, from other religions? I mean, has science got a bit more of a place there? I mean, I know it's no, it's, there's no dogma, right? So it doesn't tell you what you have to believe, does it? So could you just explain a little bit about what being a Quaker means and, and why being a Quaker is different from some other religions? Could you talk about that a little bit? So it's part of the Christian church, but it's rather different from almost every other denomination because uh, worshippers are not told what they have to believe you are told to work it out for yourself. And there have been many scientists who have been Quakers. Um, the names you might have heard of, besides the Nobel Prize winner, Joe Taylor for Pulsars, um, Kathleen Lonsdale, Sir Arthur Eddington, were all Quakers. Uh, and because 
you are not told what you have to believe and you are allowed to change your understanding as you grow, I hope, in wisdom. It's a faith that suits many scientists because as scientists, our understanding, we hope, grows and develops with time. So equally, your religious understanding can grow and develop in Quakerism. Now, you uh, were invited to talk at the Scottish Parliament, right, I believe? Yet, but yes, I have been invited. <laughs> uh, at the Scottish Parliament, they have prayers, short prayers. Um, not every day, but several days before the Parliament session begins. And uh, they have asked me if I will come and lead the prayers one day. Y ahora te mucho a la and you spend a lot of time with your family, right, now? And they... You have a son? A physicist. And collaborates with somebody in the university here. So he knows about Donostia, San Sebastian, and has been... I think to DIPC to visit and, and work. Um, yeah. Uh, my daughter in law is a theologian, and I have two grandsons. So whether they become theologians or physicists or neither, we'll see. What is the difference between theology and physicists? <laughs> I think there's not a lot of difference. Both are making inquiry. Uh, in slightly different domains, but it's, you know, you are thinking, exploring, wondering, trying to understand. Mm. And in, you know, you have worked in many other topics. What is the part of ast astronomy that uh, now uh, interests you more? Ah, perdón, ¿cuál es la parte de...? Sorry, talking in, Spanish, in English again there. What's the part of astronomy that you're most interested in? areas. Um, one is because as our equipment has got better, we can take shorter exposures, better time resolution. And we find that there are many phenomena in the universe where, you know, suddenly there's a big blast of radio waves and then quiet. And two weeks later, big blast of radio waves from the same spot and then quiet. So we are now able to explore what we call the time domain. We don't have to take these long exposures anymore. And with short exposures, we're discovering a whole range of amazing phenomena. That, I think, is probably the newest and hottest bit of astronomy. But the other thing that has happened is that we have opened a whole new spectrum called gravitational waves or gravitational radiation just in the last few years. And I find that particularly exciting. I was one of the people who believed that there is such a radiation and that we would detect it one day. I was not sure I would still be alive when they detected it, but I am. And lots of fascinating new results coming in there. So to be, see the opening of a whole new spectrum is a real privilege. Um, well, is and what is the thing, of, of all the things that you know that you don't know, what would you like to know? I think I would like to have better understanding of what gives some of these very short bursts of radio waves or gamma rays or things like that. Um, with our, our better time resolution, we are finding suddenly many, many short duration phenomena and well, there's rather a flood of it at the moment which is exciting but also a little daunting so um, I hope I'm around long enough to see some better understanding of what gives some of these short bursts yes, neutrons. what about neutron stars Maybe. Um, neutron stars I think we have quite a good understanding of what they are made of. 
and we understand how pulsars work, but we find neutron stars in quite a lot of other places as well, and I think we have not yet fully explored or fully understand, understood everything that neutron stars can give us by way of signals. Entre los años 2002 y 2004, so, uh, from 2002 to 2004, you were the president of the Royal Astronomical Society and also of another academy, the Scottish Academy, I believe, as well. So that sort of institutional role that you've played uh, requires uh, a lot of time, but it doesn't really give you a lot of rewards. Do you see it as a duty? Uh, to make sure, sort of, you know, your duty to make sure that science is cleaner, a cleaner place, sort of, uh, people get credit for what they've actually done, that, that there's no fraud, um, because there is evil in science, isn't there? In fact, Ignacio Pérez and Joaquín Sevilla, uh, they've actually been talking about uh, the evils of science, so they does exist. There are two or three of them. So can you tell us what are the evil things or the bad things about science, in, in current science? What would you say? Do you think there's too much competitiveness? Do you think there's, you know, overriding pressure or desire to publish? Do you think people aren't very careful about checking their data? Uh, passion for publishing, not for passion for knowledge. Yeah, no, I, I think all of those, every one of them that you mentioned, is an issue or a potential issue. Uh, we are under a lot of pressure to publish. Um, you may not get more money for research unless you publish. So that's not, I mean, it's important that you do publish, but you can be under too much pressure to publish too quickly. And that leads to people taking shortcuts and things like that. So that, that's not, I think, totally good for science. Um, but it's almost inevitable the way science is funded and you know the way the way it works these days that you you have those kinds of pressures uh, and i would hate to be the editor of a journal because you must get a deluge of manuscripts please publish my results please publish please publish it must be shocking <laughs> But sometimes it was a case in Bell Labs with the nanotechnology wonder kid. Sometimes in big collaborations, for example, we have learned the Nobel Prize for Atophysics. Atophysics requires uh, no, no como física de particles. Not particle physics. <laughs> there was immense, they require immense groups of collaborators. And it's very difficult to actually, you know, know exactly what's happening. I mean, can one researcher be responsible for all the data that's published in, an, in a paper? Is that possible these days? Just about possible in some situations, yes. Uh, you know, a supervisor and a graduate student working together. Oh, yeah. So that'll be okay. But if it's a much bigger collaboration involving expensive equipment, facilities that many people use, and it gets much more difficult, yes, to know who to blame and who to credit equally. Yes, it's difficult. In cualquier caso, si está But uh, if someone's, you know, happy to receive the glory, then perhaps they ought to be happy to receive the, you know, shame if what they are publishing turns out not to be true. I'd like to think so, yes, but I think maybe there's a little bit of wriggling goes on. <laughs> okay. Right, so just to finish on a bit of a, a lighter note, what is it that prompts a brilliant Cambridge student? How come you ended up in Oxford? Yeah, well, Oxford has been very, very generous to me. Um, I've had many different jobs, uh, and I remember in my last paid job, I was dean of a faculty. Is that something you understand in this country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, I was dean of a faculty. Well, in fact, we have many deans. This yes. country just passed in deans. Yes, yeah, but they're very important people. <laughs> and I, I was not particularly enjoying this job. 
I had time to go to a conference, the International Astronomical Union, which was meeting in Sydney, Australia. Bumped into a former colleague. She said, let's have breakfast together tomorrow. We have breakfast. I said, I think I'm going to retire early. I don't like this job. She took one mouthful of breakfast and said, would you come to Oxford? I said, yeah, of course I would. She had fixed it up by lunchtime from Australia. <laughs> So I went to Oxford. I, I'm, you know, a retired person. My pension is my income, so I'm a visiting academic, I think. I have been visiting there for about 15 years now. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> si, si IPC, if you want to come here at the DIPC, we'll get you, you know, but a week, we'll it'll just take a week to set up, maybe even just an afternoon, uh, because we'd love to have you at the DIPC. But just a question that I'm really interested to ask you. How is it possible in, uh, in an era in which science has contributed to solving so many problems, um, how, uh, and, and how is it that we have these anti-science movements? How can we explain that rationally after all that science has done for humankind? I'm not sure there is a rational explanation, um, but I do my best to counter it by meeting with people who have jobs not in science, but who are interested in science. For instance, there are many amateur astronomical societies, astronomical yeah. groups, and I regularly go and speak to many of them. So I do a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, partly just to help them see what's happening in professional astronomy, wh where things have got to but also because a lot of my education was funded by taxpayers. They are taxpayers. That is probably the only way I can pay back the public who have funded me, funded my education, funded my research. So I do a lot of speaking to amateur astronomical societies and, and bodies like that. So education, education of the people is the only way. Mm. Professor Len, in his brilliant charla de ayer, citaba. Professor Len, yesterday, in his uh, uh, fantastic talk, talked about the vaccine, the vaccine that saved so many lives. We have uh, Ms. Tureki, uh, who is here, and in fact, she has a bodyguard. Uh, she has to go around with a bodyguard. She had to in Germany because uh, they were developing the vaccine very, very quickly. Uh, they had thousands of volunteers who volunteered to uh, be guinea pigs for the vaccine, if you like. So, Oslin Dureki, uh, she has contributed to uh, saving so many lives, but then she has to go around with, uh, a, with a bodyguard. How can you explain that? Does it have an explanation? I wasn't aware of that, actually, till you just told me, so... We have to, tenemos que hacer más pasión por knowledge. We have to do, you know, create more passion for knowledge so that we can win people over. Una una última. Okay, one last, it's not a question, it's a request. Jocelyn uh, came to open an astronomical exhibition uh, which has just been opened in Tabacolet. It's fantastic. It's absolutely amazing. I hadn't seen it before we went with her, and it was absolutely amazing. And uh, I wrote that point 12, which explains black holes. That's fantastic. I like that. And today, technology, basic uh, research, has enabled technology that enables us to listen to the noise uh, produced by the clashing of two uh, black holes uh, two billion years ago. Uh, that's fantastic, right? Being able to hear that noise with these sophisticated uh, apparatus, but we don't even need that uh, because you actually can sing and you can whistle that same sound, so we don't need all that expensive equipment. So could you do that for us now? Would you mind? So when two black holes merge, they start by going slowly. They get closer and go faster. Kepler's law, so it goes. I'll take a drink of water first. Yeah, That's a bit faint. Um, the microphone, subirle. 
So it starts low, the two stars orbiting, sorry, orbiting each other slowly. They get closer and go faster. So it goes whoop. And that's the sound that a gravitational wave would make if we could hear it, a chirp. And one of the real delights. <laughs> It's a real, it's a real... Right, that noise is not just the noise of black holes. Uh, it's a, a claim, uh, after years of science, new, uh, Newton, the concept of black holes, you know, this huge work in, in technology that has been necessary to be able to measure gra gravitational waves. What the, what's the accuracy that we have? Is it a hair, the distance of a... Well, can you tell us about that dimension? I'm not sure I know the analogy, the, the figures very well, but they are measuring tiny, tiny movements. They have big masses suspended with mirrors on them and lasers to measure the distance. And when a gravitational wave comes by, they do just a little bit like this. And the laser will see the change. It's, it's fantastic technology, and it's very, very new. It, it's really only in the last few years that we have secure detections. And a lot of people did not believe that this radiation could exist. I've always believed in it. I was not sure I'd live to see it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in that evolution of the universe that uh, Jean-Marie Len told us about uh, 3.8 uh, billion years, you know, there was a moment in time, like two billion years ago, there was a clash of black holes, and now thanks to Jocelyn Bell, we've been able to listen to it. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic moment. And this is thanks to passion for knowledge of so many people. And among them, uh, you, of course, our dear friend. One last uh, question, a joke. Dame Jocelyn uh, Bell. Oh, sounds strange, Dame, right? You know, um, sir, we're more used to Sir, but do you like being called Dame? It <laughs> <laughs> so you believe that we sell my Sir? I thought you liked Sir better. It's not a terribly nice word. Um, do you have pantomimes here at Christmas time? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in Britain, in pantomimes, there is a man dressed up as a woman, as a dame, a pantomime dame. And unfortunately, the title dame, as applied to people like me, also suggests pantomime and craziness. And the last question. And the very last question from me. You've talked about science and women. You talked in... in uh, did you talk to the Queen? I don't get much opportunity to talk to the Queen, just a little bit. And it's fairly, fairly brief. So she says, you are in Oxford. I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> you are a scientist. Yes, ma'am. And then she is shaking your hand and she gently gives a little push as she shakes your hand, and you know it's time to go. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Dame Jocelyn. It's been a privilege. But all the work, all the help you have given us, you have given the city of San Sebastian, the Basque Country, you are on honoris causa by the University of the Basque Country. Mm -hmm. It's an honor for our university. It's an honor for the DIPC. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.